Today we're going to talk about something which is very passionate to both Cat and to Orchid and to lots of leaders out there today. And it's often an area that we don't discuss. Uh, often it's, we feel, is it inappropriate to discuss it? Are we too scared to discuss it? And so today we are going to be discussing how to lead with a heavy heart. And so firstly, before we sort of um, hand it over to, to you guys, I think what we want to do is firstly acknowledge the year of 2020 that we've had and what a year. We started off in March with the pandemic hitting globally and lockdown and shutdown. And through March and April, we saw our industry have to pivot in all areas to operate businesses, to manage teams remotely, locally and globally. And at the same time, we still had to hit goals, numbers, budgets, shareholders, investors. They still wanted to maintain business economics and we had to drive through this under extraordinary times and managing teams at scale. So what I want to sort of um, hear from you guys is, first of all, I'll hand this over to Kat first. You know, what, what are the tactics? What have you learned? I mean, 2020, going through March to December, it's been such a journey. Not only the pandemic, we had Black Lives Matters, which not only affected in the US, but also 60 countries around the world. That kind of, you know, came to um, a conclusion in a way, just as the US election started to kick off and, and then everything else scaled up right through to December the 31st. And it was like, wow. And then the pandemic hit again. We suddenly saw COVID spiking in over a hundred countries. And suddenly it, that was the end of the year. I mean, first of all, you guys obviously are experts in understanding how to lead through all sorts of circumstances. But Kat, tell me, what's that journey been like? So I, I think one of the techniques to leading through complex times and with a heavy heart is is reflection what you're asking about? And part of my technique for reflection is before even diving into 2020, and I'll even say the year that 2021 has already been, um, is thinking about the fact that we were all, most of our businesses, consumer businesses were already running pretty, pretty tight and intensely pre-COVID, right? There was radical disruption. There was a ton of change happening from a direct-to-consumer perspective in the retail and restaurant business and off-premise in OTAs and third-party aggregators, right? You're, you're already sort of trying to bring a hamburger to a knife fight. You know, it was just, it was a little tough. Yeah. Um, so on top of that, we experience this collective business demand shock at the same time we're dealing with personal shock. And so for me, the first technique is recognizing the, the layer cake of trauma, the layer cake of um, emotional weight that these times have brought to our consumers, our employees, and, and to the point of this discussion, to us as individuals, as leaders, and just recognizing that like everything is heavier. We're just waking up with more weight on our shoulders. And that can only go on for so long mm -hmm. with the mindset of, you know, carry on, right? The, the mindset of the show must go on. Sometimes the curtains need to close for a second yeah. so that we can reset. That happens on Broadway. It, it happens in performances. Um, it, it happens in our lives as, as leaders. So I would say that's step one and the technique is to really appreciate and recognize the, the weight that is there, whether, the, whether we can see it with our eyes mm -hmm. or not, um, and not feel that we as leaders are immune to the weight that we recognize uh, everyone else is carrying. The second is to then have a set of techniques for ourselves. So sort of the acknowledge is step one. Step two is learn some techniques ourselves for what are our, our paths or our options um, to choose from as a leader. One might be take ourselves out of the game, take a pause, cancel the meeting, um, make it a call instead of a Zoom. How do I let some air out of the balloon? Maybe we don't have an option to stop yeah. business, but we can likely conduct it in a way that is a little lighter, a little more respectful, a little more fluid, a little more flexible, that allows the business that must go on to go on while having the courage to call out when some things don't actually have to happen. 
yeah. today or tomorrow and they can wait. So the few things we have to do today happen really well. And then the third technique is, you know, there's different answers for every team, every brand, every stage of business and every situation around the world, whether it's a pandemic or racial unrest or political craziness or just an individual trauma that someone's dealing with. But the trick is having close relationships with the team, having check-ins, regular points to communicate. So maybe when the trauma or the challenge or the, the heaviness isn't universal, you still have a way to see it and feel it and then step into our responsibility, uh, responsibility as leaders to do something about it. Yeah, no. Orchid, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you're really at the high point of consumer um, marketing, but at the same time, you're responsible for the digital transformation of Nestle. I mean, pre, pre-pandemic and pre-COVID, you know, um, Nestle is one of the pioneers of driving that, and you've been responsible um, for leading that cause. And then we enter March, we enter lockdown. How do you continue to drive innovation, motivation, passion, you know, within your teams during this time? Because at the end of the day, you know, marketing teams, brand, the brands that you represent, are relying on you to drive that innovation and keep moving. You know, how do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be remiss if I said that it was easy because, you know, especially being focused on digital innovation and, and especially technology, um, there's this habit in American culture to um, use the phrase, you know, that guy's like a machine <laughs> as a compliment, right? Yeah. And so, you know, even when we have a conversation around artificial intelligence or about how technology and machines are supposed to make our jobs easier, you know, what's lacking in the conversation sometimes is celebrating our humanity and celebrating our humanness. Um, And so, you know, in in just in the past year, you know, of course, digital transformation um, is top of mind for many organizations, you know, Nestle as well. Um, Of course, as Kat mentioned, you know, the show must go on um, to certain respects because we are responsible um, for making sure that our consumers are served to making sure that, you know, they can get the products where and when they want it. And so, yeah, I think a lot of it is leading through example. So, you know, to Kat's point about courage, um, it's also showing vulnerability, right? Um, which I think a lot of us have been trying to, you know, kind of, kind of coached out of. I mean, I think there was a generation where it's like, Hey, you know, you just got to get your game face on and like, don't show emotion. Like that's a weakness. And, you know, I think what we're offering is like, you know, let's celebrate that the strength of that, um, in checking in with your teams in, you know, you, it's not, it's not a situation where it's like, do as I say, not as I do, because you can, you know, say all day long, please take the time that you need you know, please take a break. But if we as leaders don't take that break ourselves or model that behavior, um, you know, what, what I think we lose sight of sometimes is that, you know, our actions, like certainly it sounds right, but speak louder than words. So if my team looks at me and I'm saying all day, like, hey, make sure that you completely disconnect for your PTO and for your holiday break. And yet I am responding to emails or I am doing things or online during that time, then they're going to think that, you know, maybe I'm being, being disingenuous and maybe like my expectations is that we are on constantly, even though I've said repeatedly that, that it is not. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we've got to model that behavior. We also need to understand that our actions speak louder than words. And so I think, you know, Kat and I have been talking about this for, for a bit and, you know, just, just over the past week and Kat leads these like great leadership sessions on Clubhouse. So I try to do it whenever I can, because, yeah. you know, I think her frameworks and models and just, you know, her experience and this permission um, to, you know, be vulnerable. I think that's a message that we really need to um, yeah. repeat and make sure that it comes across. Do you think that during these times, specifically, you know, as we started in March and have gone through the year, that the narrative has changed? I certainly know when it all started in March and April, I mean, from, uh, you know, from HR departments all around the world, we were kind of like, how do you deal with this? This is something new. This is something we're all in. And I remember my very first time, it was the third week in March, we did a global call with some sales teams around the world. And I remember looking at the screen, seeing people in Brazil, in Germany, in London, in France, in Milan. And it was just, they're sat in their homes and you see children, you see pets, you see families, you see life. And I think for the first time, that impact on myself was like, wow, it was an emotional impact that, hey, I'm not just dealing with 
teams and organizations around the world. I'm dealing with humans with lives. And, you know, this is very scary. And how do you move forward? Now, unfortunately, I think, well, fortunately and unfortunately, I think we've seen as we've trajected through this, that narrative has become more open. We can freely talk about uh, mental wellness, health, and, you know, what is, what looks good and, and time off and things like that. We've all begun to address it. But at the same time, a lot of businesses have become more profitable and have made more money during this period of time, specifically in media and entertainment and the industry that we're in. So that has also driven another narrative, which is like, hey, you know, we hope you're all okay, but still keep this work ethic up. I know certainly my day went, probably I added another 30% to my day because this is very easy. It's very easy to fill a calendar. It's very easy to have meetings. Then when it switches off, as you mentioned, Orchid, emails, texts, they all start coming through. I find ourselves working longer and harder during this transition than pre-pandemic, but smarter. But I also believe that the narrative has not been able to break through to address that, hey, it's okay to take time off. It's okay not to attend that meeting. It's okay to talk about it. How do you think that that transformation has happened? this in 2020 to now do you feel that the 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 corporate sort of companies are appreciating this they're recognizing it or do you think it's still challenging because of economics yeah please i you know I, i'm sure the answer varies widely um based on company culture the leader at the top of the company, you know, it starts yeah. at the top. I've talked with some CEOs for whom this has been a more challenging journey yeah. of just their own personal transformation. To their credit, this is disrupting decades of operating style. <laughs> and, and then to your point, you see the improved margin and you go, oh, <laughs> you know, this, yeah. we could, you mean we could be this profitable all the time? Let's, you know, yeah. let's keep up with this. And and, and I, I think the practical matter is, yes, in some cases, in some companies, um, there was bloat, overinvestment, maybe not necessarily the tightest operating procedures. That's a fact, that's possible, but that's not the case in many companies. And mm -hmm. so I do believe the journey of balancing how productive people have become yeah. at home, in many cases to the detriment of our emotional health or personal lives, is not yet fully reconciled with, you know, how do we need all that productive time for all the same hours or even greater hours to that point. Um, but I have seen some leaders, I've been on my own journey through it, really getting this back mm -hmm. to that third step that I shared, because yeah. they're saying they're staying so close to their people that you can't help but observe the stress, the challenge, the struggle. And it's like, you know, we do need to protect two hours every Friday and two hours every Wednesday where there are no meetings yeah. for anyone, not one department, right? That doesn't work because then other people call and, and text. Like the leadership has to put things in place that without saying you're more productive and we appreciate that with literal words, the <laughs> actions to Orchid's point, like the, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying is the, is certainly the phrase that's relevant here. Yeah. And so I've seen, I think we've all heard and maybe some on this session have been the beneficiaries of fantastic shifts in company policy, as well as leadership practice that have focused on flexibility. Mm -hmm. And so I think the journey has been amazingly fast in some companies, but that does not mean that that is true in all companies. Um, and, and to build on that too, you know, something that Kat and I have spoken about is just, um, you know, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first um, before you put it on others. And so I do want to talk about this idea of productivity a bit. Um, yeah, I'm glad, you know, uh, TikTok was on before. I'm like a little overly addicted to TikTok, which is like a whole other issue. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that is around like, you know, millennial, like there's a certain generation, I'm going to, you know, stereotype millennials, where this idea of productivity is directly tied to self-worth. Um, and so, you know, and, and I, you know, we could, you know, wax poetic all day about, you know, the origins of that and whether it's cultural, whether it's, you know, just over the past five years with technology, whatever it is, 
Um, but, you know, for us, I think, you know, there's two things. One is making sure that we as leaders like take care of ourselves and our own mental health and, you know, drawing those lines. Because Jamie, to your point, you know, communication with your teammates isn't just limited to email anymore. And it hasn't for a long time. It extends to Teams, Slack. And then like my team knows that the easiest way to get a response out of me is through text messages. And so all of a sudden, you know, we can be very overwhelmed as well. And so we cannot serve our teams um, if we ourselves are completely depleted of energy. Um, so that's one. And then another one, and I, you know, we, we touched on this already a little bit, is protecting your team's time for them. Um, and so for, for my innovation team, you know, we have uh, two hour blocks on Monday mornings. Um, just, you know, quiet time to get set up for the week, to have time to do that. And then we also have blocked off Friday afternoons to kind of wrap things up, you know, again, like this reflective time, because there's also a habit to kind of like, you know, fill your days or fill your minutes um, as a coping mechanism, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we really kind of need to set and again, like model those behaviors and set those parameters um, for our teams so that they can, you know, feel recharged, but also, you know, focus on the work. It's certainly a balance. Yeah. I, I Again, I want to tap into the, you, you raised it, uh, the millennial generation, if we're calling it that. Um, we see it. We're a global company, probably 60, 65 percent of our employees fall into that category. And during the during 2020 and even up to now, some of the things that we noticed as groups, as leaders, and we uh, jumped in to see how we could help and participate was we also found there was a lot of people living alone at that age group. OK, and I remember talking with one of my colleagues, Candace, and saying, hey, there are a lot of people in New York City in apartments on their own. I was using New York where I live. And I said, I've had conversations and literally they, you know, they can't see their parents. They can't leave their apartment. There's this. How, you know, that's the social aspect of life now. That, that's what it is. You're working 12 hours on a screen. It ends and then that's it. You're sat alone often, you know, or with a roommate and there's nothing much to do. Okay. And because so, your social aspect of, you know, at work, in the office, after the office, and weekends, all gone. And suddenly work, you have to get up every day and attend it. Okay. And then when it finishes, it's kind of like an emptiness that was left. And we started to look into that and we built a network where we would make calls and there was evening cocktails and there was things and we just quiz nights and it expanded into this thing where we created like an, an after hours social event where people would connect. And, you know, because that was one area that we saw that was really affecting a lot of people within our company was when the laptop closes. Okay, because that's when life begins, but it's not the normal life that they've been raised, you know, expecting. And I've some just jumped into the workforce. How have you seen, you know, that generation within your own respective companies? And how do you feel they're going to take this impact moving forward? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we went through a period where there was a lot of contraction. <laughs> uh, you know, we went through a period where there was a, a lot of contraction in the business, but then very quickly came out of it because of how well we were mm -hmm. set up for what was going on. And so we were hiring in, in the field and, um, and corporately. And so hiring this generation mm -hmm. where there is zero physical memory mm -hmm. of connecting to the team. It's been very interesting to manage those who remembered the office, who had relationships from the office, and we're leaning on that relationship credibility and that tether for um, connectivity compared to those who just got hired in a remote only world. And right. this is not new for many industry sectors, but it is new for a lot of product consumer mm -hmm. companies, certainly retail, where both the business itself is very physical mm -hmm. uh, and high touch. And certainly the corporate offices have tended to be over the years, even if they had been trending to that flex work schedule. So uh, for us and my experience is just the, and you touched on it with the things you started doing is how do you help people be seen? and not feel invisible. When we did our check-ins, again, back to this check-ins, the more you're talking to folks, the more the patterns of how they're feeling will emerge. They might not say it overtly, but enough people say similar things and the leader's like, hmm, I've heard the word invisible used about 500 times. I feel invisible. 
I, I feel like this strategy is invisible. I'm not sure what's going on with leadership. Doesn't matter how many memos and stuff yeah. get sent out. It's this connectivity. So uh, a few simple things. One is sending physical things to their homes. You know, something yeah. as, sim as simple as a branded mug or something with their name on it. That's like, you're a you're a part of us, what we're lacking. It's physical. In, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are so many cool companies that have popped up that make this, you know, mm -hmm. quite easy to do at scale with company brands and doing things fun and welcome kits. So that's one seems silly and tactical. It's highly strategic and important. The second is these moments of connection that are not about the business, whatever that means, phone calls, walking meetings, and not everything being Zoom because it is so, co mm -hmm. it is a high cognitive load activity. You know, people are tired. And so yep. we switch to literally walking, just walking lunch buddy meetings. Like, hey, go out, like telling people, go outside if the weather is nice enough. And if it's safe, of course, in your yep. city or community, that that encouragement of it's okay if we're on Zoom, Tell me, you're going to be off camera because you're going on a walk. That's amazing. And to Orchid's point, I'm going to lead by example and do that from time to time yeah. to shape that behavior. So those things seem to really resonate with both millennials and Gen Z. You know, some our internship program was very weird <laughs> this year. Um, right. yeah. and, and part of the internship program benefit is just being there and the cool factor and the pictures and getting the badge and all these things. So we sent them a badge, you know, the things yeah. that are commemorative. So, um, and, and I do believe they went a long way. Yeah. Okay. What did you say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think how we've approached it has been very similar um, to Kat. Our CMO, Alicia, was on earlier today. And, you know, to be honest, it, it, it felt so nice when a package showed up in my house. There was like a really nice fuzzy blanket and a scented candle. <laughs> it's like these things that didn't really happen before, but it was like a, hey, like, you know, just um, a, a reminder, like, hey, we're still thinking of you. Like, you know, obviously there's life outside of work, things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, what, one thing that I do want to bring up about, you know, we've done like happy hours or we did a, um, it was like almost like a scavenger hunt. Like we've done a lot of virtual events. Yep. Um, you know, sometimes they're hard to do. Um, and I'd be very honest here, you know, I've got, I've got a toddler, Kate's got a couple of toddlers, or Kat's got a couple of toddlers and, and it's hard. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, well now I'm going to go for two hours on this virtual scavenger <laughs> hunt. And like, do I really need to be there? And the answer is yes. Yeah. As a leader, you really do need to be there, right? Yeah. Because again, and I loved Kat saying about how your actions are so loud, I can't hear the words. Um, you know, again, like if yeah. you're not there, then it's like a, oh, you know, maybe self-care or this, maybe this time away from work isn't important, right? Yeah. If my boss isn't there or if, you know, so-and-so is not there. And so, you know, and any activities um, that you want to set up and, you know, again, like you got to you know, make your own decisions on whether or not you going, like you have the emotional energy. We haven't even talked about the emotional load um, to go there, but things that you set up for your team, like you really, you should be there, right? You should again model that behavior. So I think it's become challenging for leaders today in, in a way, because not only are they responsible and on the hook for delivering during this time and over delivering, I think has been a topic that's been talked about a lot. But, um, you know, having that on you and then having to deliver that message as well as seeing your teams, <laughs> you know, suff suffering through this, but getting up, doing the work and performing, but you see it, it's a hard balance for you guys as leaders to, to walk, in, not walk in, get up every day and open the laptop and look at people. It's so hard because you have an agenda which they might know 80% of what your agenda is, but then there's 20% that's probably coming from higher up in the company, which is a pressure on you, which you then have to translate to your teams mm -hmm. to deliver because you have a responsibility to deliver, okay? And it's your responsibility to get your teams to deliver to you. It's all about delivery has been a word I've heard across this sector throughout from March to now, delivery and execution, okay? So you guys are responsible for that. How do you maintain that from a culture standpoint? You know, because you're opening your screen, you're seeing your teams, your colleagues, and you've got things that they have to do. You've got to make them aware of things. You've got to say, hey, we're just not cooking it this month. We need to double down harder. We've got to do this. It's a balance. And, you know, how's that been for you managing that? I think one for this session, 
part of how I've managed through that is the way you led by example at the beginning of this. You said, hey, I just want to acknowledge that these are some pretty intense times. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the day after, fill in the blank, right? The day after this event, the day after that event, yeah. every one of those mornings, I whatever that first meeting is, phone call or Zoom, I'm just very human. You know, I literally, the day after the, what happened at the Capitol yeah. this last week, my first, I had a Zoom meeting the next day, we texted each other, do you want to keep it, right? Are you feeling up yeah. to it? One person said no, the, but carry on. The other said, we're, we're feeling up to it. And the first thing I did was, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it was just this, like, wow, what a crazy time. Yeah. Being very human saying, I'm torn between continuing on the work and just going to sleep, <laughs> you know, cry in a corner, but here's why yeah. I feel good about carrying on this work. And part of the, part of what makes me feel good as an individual when I choose to carry on, it's not always yeah. the answer. And that helps the team who wants to, but just needs to be bridged from the weirdness in the world they're experiencing to the normalcy that work is trying to be, you got to create that bridge. Yeah. And so the bridge for me is to say, let's remember why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Let's remember the people that are depending on us. Let's remember the, you know, starting with that before it's like, here's where the numbers are and here's where we are. There's just a different how, like a wartime CEO, yeah. a wartime leader has very different techniques mm -hmm. in some ways than a peacetime leader. And yes. in a peacetime leader, you can be a bit more driving. You know, people have a lot, their, their equity buckets, their confidence buckets are more full. Yes. Or time, high trauma time, we're running on low, possibly mm. even empty. So doing things that drain the emotional and intellectual bucket don't help capability to do work. And so the how we lead, the bridge from crazy to normal, the bridge from scary and sad to work, if we're choosing to do that is a technique the leader must get, even just try, right? The answer is the, the only thing that's bad is saying nothing. Right. And, and that I've found many leaders to their credit, so concerned that they won't say the right thing, that mm -hmm. they choose to say no things. Yeah. And then the team all through the meeting is like, is he gonna mention it? Is he, is, <laughs> is he did he not wake up in the world we woke in? Right. And so just try, you can keep it simple, even if it's, wow, this is a heavy time. Yeah, It's a struggle to get to work. Here's what's getting me able to be focused. If anyone feels the need to hop off, send me a note, let me know. Otherwise I'm finding comfort in the normalcy of this. So I'm gonna get into that. Is that okay with you all? Yeah. And just asking acknowledgement and asking for the permission, even though you don't have to, yeah. is so empathetic and human. And it lets air out of the balloon. The world keeps filling our balloon super full where it's about to pop. It's the leader's job to let the air out of that balloon. So then people can go, okay, I have the energy mm -hmm. to go, you know, to go to work, to take some criticism, to um, call that client one more time to sell, you know, imagine the sales team, you know, the sales teams right now, picking up the phone and calling someone. If you don't know who's on the other end of that phone. All that situation. Tough. Yeah. 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 So Orkin, please. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just add, you know, um, to Kat's point of wartime CEOs, I mean, just context, right? Yeah. I think if you kind of over explain or give like context, like why X is important, um, that helps, right? Because otherwise it's very easy to say, all right, well, here's our to-do list. Like, let's go down and let's just do a status, right? Let's, let's right. run the status and be like, oh, that's delayed. Okay. Tell me why it's delayed. It's like, actually it's important. Like, you know what? That can be de delayed, not a huge deal. Or if it's like, actually, we really need to prioritize that because if we don't, then like these things can't happen or like we can't serve our consumers in the way that, you know, they're expecting. And so I think just, you know, rounding out that context of like the why behind right. a lot of the activities, although it feels like you're taking more time is actually incredibly important in these times. Yeah. Do you think as well as we, as we left 2020, it seems like we're still in the same year, we've moved into 2021. Um, 
it's, it's now, you know, we're looking, there's the vaccine, there's all of this. Again, I look back at 2020, it's a very scary time. People were scared. And I don't think any, this generation, I think my generation, millennial generation, Gen Z, to get up in a morning and be scared for something that we as a, as a globe have no control over and no answers and have to get up and work. And then, okay, we're then in countries where political unrest and protest and there's all this change that has gone on in such a short period of time. Probably more has happened this year than in the last 15, 20 years, okay? I look at it from a HR standpoint. There's not one HR department in any corporate company in the world that was prepared for this. And therefore, they didn't have the answers. They didn't have the strategies. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have anything to push down. What happened was the immediate response is your person going to your leader. Hey, it's, that's the only kind of comfort zone I think that was left. It's like, you know me, we talk, you're my supervisor, you're my manager. You know, can we have a conversation? Which brings it back to where we started. Is like, can you talk about it? Can you talk about your feelings? Can you talk about what scares you? Can you take that time? And I think if anything this year, that's been exposed, that narrative, right to the boards, to the CEOs, all the way down. As we move with this optimism into 2021, with vaccines and return to work strategies that I'm sure your company, your company, my company have all talked about, the, you know, the holy grail getting back into the office. Do you think that we have take, we're gonna be able to take all of these learnings and compassion and emotion and hum, human aspects of our day-to-day -day work life now into 2021 and beyond? Do you think it has changed? Do you think it is a transformation outside of our normal business roles? You think it's something that will continue or do you fear that it's going to just accelerate into something else? Um, I'm so sorry. I'm going to jump in really quick because I actually have a call right now. So I'm going <laughs> to, okay. All right. There's David. All right. It's great seeing you. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I gotta go. This was going great. We were just like, you know, texting with the production team. We didn't want to cut you guys off, but I know you've got your kids. You've got a job. So thank you, Orchid. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Jamie. Thank um, you. This was, you know, really, really fantastic. Again, I know, you know, Kat, you're all over Clubhouse. You host Office Hours. You know, we're all excited to see what you what you cook up next um, in, in in your journey. And and you know, you often lend your insight into advice to so many other business leaders. And uh, it's, it's it's greatly appreciated what you do. So thank you for spending your time with us, Jamie. Uh, amazing job. Thank you for leading the conversation. And we're gonna keep things rolling. So we hope to see you guys back on our virtual stage soon. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kat. That was a